I talked about it. <laughs> All right, recording has started. So we missed the first part there, um, so be it. Uh, all right, so <laughs> our main intention for today is to build capacity to work with the Enviro DIY sensor stations and understand and work with the data. So this is an overview. There's lots of subtlety here beyond what we're gonna be able to talk about today. Um, we are, uh, <clears throat> Use the resources that are available and be patient with your knowledge building. Okay, that's just something to emphasize for all of this stuff. When you get into the details, it can seem very overwhelming. So just be patient with yourself. We're all continuing to learn about this process of working with these stations and understanding the data and working with the data. Um, so this is something to address with regard to uh, the folks who are uh, attending the workshop today communicate and ask questions of the station owner. This is something we've been trying to emphasize um, that this, folks who are working with the stations should be in regular dialogue with station owners. Okay. Um, so this is uh, a Delaware River Watershed Initiative um, funded effort here. Uh, Delaware River Watershed Initiative is a Penn, William Penn Foundation project. Um, and that's just kind of some background here about that. You can certainly go to this website and look into more details about the DRWI. Okay, as I mentioned, the primary goal um, with the sensor stations, I've been, we've been mentioning this um, over and over, but the primary goal in the context of DRWI was to get these stations to uh, groups who want to use the stations for their own purposes. We've been supporting that. Stroud has been supporting that via workshops and guidance materials, as well as a lot of one-on-one -on -one support, trainings and small groups events. And as you know, Shannon and Rachel are, go out regularly to maintain stations and provide technical support. A secondary goal here is to analyze the basin-wide data set. That's that's really what Deanna and Mark are working on these days. Um, so, and they're gonna give us some updates on where they're at with that. So just a, a quick view here of this product adoption curve. This is a new project. It's a new realm that we're working in. And we're really, we should take note that we're really in this range here where we're just kind of making this a, public, uh, pr a publicly available product. And um, so there's, a select group of people that are involved and um, hope, hopefully we're just going to continue to broaden the effort and build resources so that more people can um, work in this realm of things. Okay, so I will pass it off to George Seeds. Um, I'm going to just be advancing slides for George. So George, just let me know when you want me to advance the slide and, okay. I'll, and I'll pass it off to you. Okay, very good. Thanks, Dave. Um, we thought at, at the outset here, it would be good to just put this, um, all these efforts in context. Um, the, the, the big picture uh, perspective may be obvious to many of you, uh, but I know for me, it, it was not obvious initially. Uh, and I thought it would be worthwhile just to remind ourselves of it today. Um, you know, our individual work with stream sensors um, obviously contributes to the individual sensor owner organizations, water quality efforts at the local level, um, but at a regional and societal and, and even global level, uh, we, we as master watershed stewards involved in this initiative uh, are also contributing to a much larger growing citizen science movement uh, that's helping to build the capacity to form scientific research that otherwise might not be possible uh, due to a lack of funding, uh, staff, and, and other resources. Uh, <coughs> citizen, <coughs> excuse me. Citizen science efforts in the environmental realm uh, are also increasingly important due to the weakening of regulations to protect water quality in the environment. And this should give us all a lot of satisfaction from the work that we are doing. Um, I've included 
several definitions and descriptions of citizen science here. Uh, I won't read each one of them, uh, but you can see that they all very much apply uh, to the work that we're doing. Um, okay, Dave, you can switch, switch to the next slide. Um, I also included on this slide um, two quotes from the leadership at the William Penn Foundation to illustrate uh, how fundamental citizen science is in their vision for the Delaware Watershed uh, Initiative. Um, so I'll, I'll, just, I'll just read these two because I think they really encapsulate um, and illustrate and put into good context the work that we're all doing. Um, from Andrew Johnson, who's the Director of Watershed Protection for the William Penn Foundation, the goal of the DRWI Citizen Science is to not only engage the public with conservation, but to train volunteers, generate meaningful professional quality water data that can be shared more broadly across the watershed. And from Janet Haas, the board chair, we wanted to build a framework that would harness the enormous capacity of conservation organizations to work together on a shared approach to see whether that critical mass could affect greater change. The result is a model that will not only have an effect in the Delaware River watershed, but also provide a model that can be replicated in other watersheds tackling similarly complex issues. Uh, so I think, you know, if we think about those, I think, at least for me anyway, and, and, and hopefully everyone else, I think that when, when we think about our work in this context, uh, it really gives a get much deeper and broader meaning and hopefully contributes to our own personal uh, gratification and satisfaction in this work that we're doing. And we can see that all of the detail and technical um, issues and learning that takes, that takes place and th the methodology that we all use is all put forward to this end, to this, to this, greater, to this greater good. So um, we just thought it would be worthwhile to, um, to, to highlight that. And in the last point, um, Master Watershed Stewards, Master Watershed Stewards support local watershed groups across the Delaware River Basin and the Stroud Water Research Center in building science capacity to better address questions of how local watersheds function and how to restore and protect these resources. We all know that, but uh, as I said, I just thought it would be good to put all this work in this, in this uh, broader context. Okay. Okay, thanks, George and Carol. Hi, so glad you all could join us today. Could you go to the next slide? So basically, I'm uh, going to give you some stories about how the sensor station data has been put to use. Many people uh, want to know some of the ways this is being done. I'm bringing you two stories, one of education and the other of um, watershed management. So one is uh, involving a partnership um, involving East Stroudsburg University, who are, who's working at the Cherry Valley National Wildlife Refuge. Slide change. So just to look on the left, this the Cherry Valley National Wildlife Refuge was added to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife National Wildlife Refuge system in 2008. And you can see in the map how many of these refuges are needed across or have been established across the United States to uh, protect and allow space for breeding, wintering, and foraging of migrating species across North America. Um, it's more than just migrating species at this point, it's, it's conserving wild spaces and biodiversity. Um, Cherry Valley National Wildlife Refuge has up to 20,000 migrating raptors and more than 140 bird species because of the large blocks of unfragmented forest along the Kittatinny Ridge, where, uh, which provides breeding grounds for interior forest birds. Slide. In the map on the right, these are the DRWI clusters and the Kittatinny and the Cherry Valley Refuge is in the upper, the most northern cluster, the Poconos Kittatinny. So Paul Wilson is Associate Professor of Biology at East Stroudsburg University and he focuses on monitoring of aquatic systems in the Cherry Valley Refuge as part of the DRWI. He has three ways that he involves his students that through his stream ecology class, student research projects, and the environmental club. Slide. 
So the stream ecology class, it's a field research class. There they are during storm uh, collecting samples. Students learn field and laboratory methods that are typically used by professionals. So then they bring it back to the lab for analysis. Uh, and then they present their, wor their work in science posters. Slide. Uh, research students at the university use data from four Mayfly data loggers in Cherry Creek, and they learn to do much of what you're doing, which is to maintain the sensor stations and conduct macroinvertebrate and chemical sampling. Slide. Uh, then finally, the environmental club includes students from all majors at the university, which is very interesting, uh, who are interested in stream ecology, ecology and aquatic life. So it's a great example of integrating uh, education with a refuge and a watershed. Slide. Another example are the stream stewards. This is about watershed management. Um, this is a partnership between the Nature Conservancy directed by Kim Hatchadurian, the National Park Service, and the Stroud Water Research Center. Slide. So it takes place at First State National Historic Park, uh, which was designated in 2013 for its cultural values. It's both uh, urban and uh, forest land. Um, the stream stewards, they are a citizen monitoring program that uh, focus on several of the tributaries that run into Brandywine Creek. Uh, there's the star on the map where they are, which joins the Christina River, where the Delaware River meets the estuary. And the bigger picture for this project is very important because estuaries host more wildlife births than any other ecosystem in the world, and they really are the nursery and breadbasket for the world. They have a wide range of habit, they also have a very wide range of habitats. So the stream stewards, their work is going to decrease pollutants into the estuary. Slide. So they are focusing on the impact of stormwater runoff and their streams uh, surround, in the next slide you'll see a map of a large mall that their uh, monitoring involves. They use six mayfly data loggers. They measure conductivity, depth, temperature, and turbidity. They also take grab samples for E. coli, macroinvertebrates, and pH and chlorides. The, of course, the streams surrounded by mainly natural areas have low conductivity and they're compared with the streams surrounded by residential and commercial development, which have high baseline conductivity and conductivity spikes into the tens of thousands microsiemens per centimeter. Slide. So here's some of their data. The stream stewards began in 2016. Now the data through 2018 in the higher quality streams, the first three on the left, uh, they have found a, a decrease in the macroinvertebrate aggregated index for streams, the mice scores of insects. Um, but even these high, so, so the lower uh, value streams, I guess, are kind of already at a basement level, uh, uh, but, or cellar level, but um, the um, higher streams are really still only at a fair level. Slide. So the main thing I want to tell you is that um, the stream stewards provided information from all of their sampling to the Delaware Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control to assist with pollution control strategies for TMDLs. And one of their big findings um, in you, if you, uh, is that um, they uh, investigated and found an oil water separator at an auto store, a large auto store in the Concord Mall that was inadvertently, unknowingly tied, um, I'm sorry, that was, had been inadvertently, yes, and unknowingly tied into the storm sewer system. And so, uh, and if you see the bottom right picture, there's a picture of a retention basin that takes the runoff from the mall, but that overflows into one of their streams, Rocky Run, which is one of the lower quality streams. They worked very cooperatively, the mall, the store, county officials and the stream stewards to mitigate streams pollution and to stop that runoff in that case. Slide. Uh, this is a, a list of who to call when there are water emergencies and water problems that you run. It's important to know that the master watershed stewards have this. I created this one for Chester County um, so that you can have the detail on who to call, whether hours are available, how to contact them and other important information. Uh, for emergencies, they are open 24 hours, seven days, 365 days a week. New slide. Also, it covers uh, construction site and industrial issues such as salt piles. There's even the, you, the link for the salty stream video by the Stroud. New slide. And also for broken water mains. Um, water, even broken water mains sometimes called major fish kills, in which case it would bump it up to a, a high level problem on the first slide. Slide. 
So I'm not going to take the time um, to go into this, but uh, just to let you know that um, there, I have some stories I can tell you about finding unprotected or poorly protected slide um, uh, salt piles. Could you say change a slide? Um, and it takes multiple efforts to, to, to end something like this. Eventually the DEP gets involved. Um, and there's another slide that had, uh, where I observed human waste at a sensor station. Um, so I can, if you'd like to know more about these, I'd be glad to tell you what I did. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Carol. Excellent presentation. And uh, just to one follow up on that, uh, Carol, you have those um, contact sheets available so anyone can be in touch with you if you if they'd like a electronic copy of those sheets correct yes yeah, so may if there's anything that we're going to be routinely sending out there may be one or two other things after this we can include it in that if that's a, if that will work yeah that's great or you can contact me individually okay so um rachel and i are going to talk a bit about now data and resources to support uh the work with these stations um, so I just wanted to emphasize this website. It's under, it's under the Wiki Watershed website, DRWI. Uh, it has a lot of resources in there. It's where you uh, enter the field visit data sheet information. You can also access previous information. You can get raw copies of the data sheets. Um, there are links to monitor my watershed and monitor my watershed help re resources, links to the manuals, links to the quick guides, and links to the video tutorials. So make sure you know and reference this um, site to uh, build your knowledge on everything. Uh, Wiki Watershed, just a brief overview here. Wiki Watershed is a toolkit um, that Stroud, the Stroud Center has put together. Um, six different tools in here, Model My Watershed, Monitor My Watershed, Enviro DIY, the LeafPack Network, MacroInvertebrates.org, and the Water Quality Mobile App. We're primarily talking about Enviro DIY and Monitor My Watershed today. Monitor my watershed is where all the data from the from these Enviro DIY sensor stations are being sent. Okay, um, just to point out, there is help available in Wiki Watershed. Okay, um, you can go to Wiki Watershed directly and go to the help tab, or you can just go to this website site. As I mentioned, videos, manuals, and there are curricula available too um, to use some of these tools. Uh, Model My Watershed, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but this is a really good resource to use for understanding your watershed. You can delineate a site, uh, the watershed at a site where a sensor station is located, delineate the upstream watershed, and uh, delve into the land uses that are, that are there. Um, predicted nutrient loads, um, predicted sediment loads, this type of thing. You can change land use and change uh, conservation practices to see how those different changes can affect um, water quality. This is some of what I was talking about of where you can change land cover practices, just uh, model different scenarios. If there's a development going in, you can model that development and see, predict how it's going to affect things. So, um, I'm going to skip through the rest of the Model My Watershed stuff. Just know that Model My Watershed is definitely a resource that you can use along with the sensor station data to get a, a bigger picture view of the watershed. So Monitor My Watershed is a data portal. Um, the Enviro DIY sensor stations and the Leaf Pack Network are both, um, uh, both Data sets from both of those uh, programs are being sent to monitor my watershed. This is the opening screen that you get when you um, go into monitor. This is the map that you'll get when you click on this tab, br uh, browse sites. You can see there are stations across the country, a lot here in the Delaware Basin. Um, one thing to point out, monitor is entirely public, okay? You don't need a login to use it at all. You can access all the data um, at all the stations without having any login. It's entirely public. Okay, um, just again to point out, there are help resources. There is a manual for using Monitor My Watershed that describe, and there are videos that describe um, just how to physically, functionally use the, the tool to graph your data and to display your data. Okay. Um, 
there is a way to give feedback every now and again. There are, we do find bugs uh, that just show up in Monitor. Uh, we encourage folks to report those as they come up um, using the help tab. And there's a uh, kind of leads you to different ways in, that you can report on issues. Um, again, just using Browse Sites tab to access the data. Um, when you go, when you get to a particular site, you can click on that site and then go deeper into the data for that site. Takes you to this page here where you can see a map of the station location, some information about the owner and deployment date and such about, uh, for a particular station. And then you have these different panels uh, that are the different data types for the stations. Um, there's other screens like this where you can select out the different parameters that you want to display and display them um, graphically. You can overlay parameters as shown here. You can click these on and off to get different uh, views. You can also overlay different sites on one another. So you can overlay, for instance, one parameter from different sites to compare sites. Rachel's gonna go into this in more detail. So this is just some key points about Monitor. It's new and in development. So this is just, I'd like people to know this just so they can understand that your feedback is going to be important on issues and feature requests. As I mentioned, it's entirely public. Um, help resources, definitely access those. You know, it's not just a snap of the fingers to learn all of the features that are in Monitor. So definitely be patient with yourself and use the resources to, to build your knowledge on it. GitHub is a way to, um, again, to provide feedback on bugs and to, to um, you know, record feature requests. If you see something that you're that is not there that would be nice to have, you're certainly welcome to put it in as a feature request. Um, again, with Monitor My Watershed as well as this workshop in general, there's a lot of it's a pretty complex process that we're involved with. So be patient in building your knowledge. Um, and um, we will move on to Rachel, who's going to get into some specifics of maintenance and quality control with the stations. And um, we'll pass it on to you, Rachel. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. If you could just stop sharing your screen, I'm going to start sharing mine. Okay. All right. There we go. Great. All right. So like Dave was saying, my name is Rachel Johnson. I've been working at Stroud for almost three years now, and I've installed many of the sensor stations that you will be working with. Um, a brief overview of what we're going to be talking about is generally how the sensor station functions. Um, we're gonna review your maintenance and quality control tasks, actually what you're doing in the field. And then we're gonna see how those tasks relate to the monitor by watershed data. So before we get started, um, I just wanted to point out two questions. One is, what do we mean when we talk about maintenance in QC? And in my mind, when I hear those two things, I think of three main kind of chunks. One being the maintenance tasks for the Mayfly data logger. One being your maintenance tasks for the sensors themselves. And then for QC, it's basically what you're doing in the field, taking handheld measurements to check what the sensors are reading match what you're taking in the field. Um, so starting with the sensor station functions, um, the picture here on the left is the Mayfly data logger. I like to think of it as the brain of the sensor station. It was created by Shannon Hicks, who's our electrical engineer. She also designed the whole sensor station itself. Um, but basically what the Mayfly is doing is taking all these data points that you see here on the screen and sending continuous data every five minutes to monitor my watershed, which is the site that Dave was just going over. Um, and monitor my watershed actually graphs the data and makes it look all pretty for you. Um, but I wanted to point out also that the Mayfly doubles as a sensor in itself because it's actually recording the air temperature and the date and time. So there were just a few things that I wanted to point out on the Mayfly that you're going to need to know when you download your data in the quality control section. 
Um, the first one, A, being the on-off switch. And then B there is the vertical micro SD card adapter. So that's where your memory card is going to go. And then C are just some LED lights. And getting familiar with those lights will help you in your troubleshooting. So those are the main portions of the board. I know it can look really overwhelming to someone who's new to seeing it. But if you just focus on those main parts, it'll kind of help when you're working with it. So now we're going to go into the sensor functions themselves. Most of the um, sensor stations that we're working with have two main sensors. The first one being the CTD sensor, that stands for conductivity, temperature, and depth. That is the one on the left. And then the second one is the turbidity sensor. It's the OBS3 Plus by Campbell Scientific. And OBS stands for optical backscatter which I'll explain here in a second. It's basically just how the sensor is taking a turbidity measurement. In the bottom left-hand corner, there's a close-up of the window of the turbidity sensor. And basically what it does is it shines a light through the water column and is reflecting, it's measuring the particles that are reflecting back. So the main issue with this is if something gets hung up over that window, your turbidity um, values are going to be fouled. So that's really the importance of cleaning that sensor. And <laughs> I like to include this picture just because, just like anything in nature, if you leave it along, if you leave it alone long enough, nature is going to take over. So again, reinforcing the importance of you guys going out and cleaning your sensors. Moving on to the CTD sensor, I just wanted to point out um, which part of the sensor measures each variable. So the conductivity is measured by the four little metal screw, screws in there. Um, and if anything grows in between, like algae or some macroinvertebrates, that's, that little slot is a really nice home for some macroinvertebrates. If anything gets in there, it's gonna throw off your conductivity readings. So that's the main part to focus on with your CTD sensor. Um, this is the inside of the CTD sensor, it's the circuit board, and that's where temperature is being recorded. And um, this is how depth is being measured. That white disc there is the pressure transducer. Transducer. It is measuring the pressure of um, the water to the water surface. So from that little white disc to the water surface. Um, but it's extremely sensitive. So when we go over cleaning, you want to be careful not to really poke or push that pressure transducer at all because it will break and then you will need a new $500 sensor. So there are two main types of visits, one being your maintenance visit, which is basically cleaning your sensors, and then the second is your quality control visit. So we have two different quick guides for these, um, which are available to you in the Wiki Watershed site. If you don't know where to find these, um, we can talk about it later in the question section or just put it in the chat and we can get these to you, but they're extremely helpful to have with you in the field because they walk you through step by step what you want to be doing in the field. Um, so for maintenance visits, you, I recommend them about once a week, but really you want to be looking at your data on Monitor My Watershed to kind of instruct you on when to go into the field, and we'll go over that a little bit later. Um, but these visits are a lot more frequent than the quality control visits, which happen quarterly. Um, so we are going to go through really quickly the quality control quick guide because the beginning of it is actually the same as the maintenance quick guide. It's just instructing you on how to clean it. Um, so I figured for sake of time, we'll just go over this one. So these are your quarterly visits when you're cleaning your sensors and you're double checking, making sure that your handheld measurements are matching what the sensors are saying. So we go through, oh, and I want to point out, um, there's a lot more information on all of this stuff on our online, online manual, which is on envirodiy.org. So we go through and tell you what, to, what you want to bring to the site. Your main thing that you really need is your visit data sheet and a pencil, because you want to document everything that you're doing when you're in the field. Um, we also have your cleaning brush, a metric ruler, and then these 
meters were included in your QC kits that if you are one of the stewards that were assigned to be doing the QC um, visits, you have these things we've given to you. So they're just your handheld meters, a blank micro SD card, and then um, some supplementary items. So this page, the second page, walks you through the 10 main steps that you're going to be doing while in the field. And after each step, it tells you exactly where to write which portion on your visit data sheet. So I really recommend bringing this with you because if you forget a step or you're feeling overwhelmed because it is a lot to remember when you're out in the field and there's different um, environmental factors to play, it might be hot, it might be raining, definitely just try to bring this with you and follow it step by step. Um, I just wanted to point out, whenever you're in the field, make sure you're documenting in the right time zone. So right now we're in EDT, um, which is Eastern Daylight Time, and they have these handy, because I always forget, I can never remember if it's standard time or daylight time. So we have the dates of when that, those different time zones are. But as long as you're recording what time zone you're in, it'll help you um, when you're trying to translate that or monitor my watershed, because they have different time zones. Um, this is just how you access your data. So into the main heart of it, what we want to talk about is cleaning the sensors. Um, you, I think all of you have been given this maintenance brush, which is perfect because the white bristles are nice and soft and they're angled to fit perfectly inside the CTD sensor when trying to um, clean the conductivity screws. And then there is the stiff gray bristles on the opposite side that's perfect for cleaning the turbidity window. Again, being careful not to poke or damage that pressure transducer. So again, a close-up of your CTD screws. We'll go through this a little bit later. I have um, graphs that show you what the data looked like when before and after cleaning. Um, but these are what you want to focus on. Usually the white bristles and just swishing the CTD around in the water is good enough to clean those screws. Um, I would really be careful if you're thinking about using a Q-tip or anything. You don't really want to be sticking anything inside the CTD sensor to avoid damage to the pressure transducer. But if you do see that your conductivity data is not matching your handheld meter, you might need to remove the sensor bundle and look at it a little bit clearer clearer to make sure that nothing's growing in there. Um, but ideally you would want to leave the sensors where they are and just stick your hand down in the water to clean it. But sometimes in certain cases you do want to remove it. Um, this is a closer up close picture of the turbidity window. We, um, if you look at the picture on the left, you can see the window and then what we call the eyeball. That's really what you want to be looking for. Um, to make sure that you can see that because again, if anything is covering that, your turbidity values are going to be um, skewed. So you wanna take the gray bristles and just kind of run your hand down the sensor bundle and you'll kind of feel a little indent. And then that'll kind of show you where the um, window is on the turbidity sensor. So this is where you're going to be taking your handheld measurements. Um, one being the staff gauge. So this is to QC your depth data. And then um, this is one of my favorite ways of double checking to make sure your depth data is accurate is by actually using a ruler. And the one thing you want to look out for with this is where your zero point is on the ruler that we've given you, or if you're using a different one, just make sure that that zero is lined up with the pressure transducer, which is where that red dotted line is in the picture. Um, and then you're gonna measure from that to the water surface. With the staff gauge, um, you take your staff gauge reading and subtract your sensor station water depth. That's the um, reading that you get from your sensor and you will get an offset. And as long as that number stays the same, then you're pretty sure that nothing major has gone wrong with your CTD sensor. And this is getting into more of your handheld reading. So this is the HANA connectivity meter that we've given you. Um, you just wanna make sure that it's calibrated and then making sure that that calibration fluid is washed off before you take your reading. 
And then this is QC for the temperature. And then at the very, okay, getting into, so this is what I was talking about, about um, the Mayfly maintenance tasks. Basically all that is, is just downloading your data. So to do that, you turn off the logger, you remove your SD card, and then you insert a blank one and turn the logger back on. So the blue arrow there is the on off switch again, and then the red arrow is where the SD card is inserted. And then one more really handy thing that is in this quick guide is just the outline of where you're going to be documenting all of this information. So there's a lot on this data sheet. It can get overwhelming, but that's why the very first couple of pages in the quick guide are super helpful because it breaks it up into sections and tells you exactly where to write everything. So it makes it really simple. Well, let's see. So there are just a few more things that I wanted to talk about in relating the, um, what you see on monitor my watershed into the field. So the one thing that I really recommend is checking your data often, if not daily, at least a couple times a week to get familiarized with what is the normal functioning of your station and what do the normal patterns online look like? Because there's certain patterns that you'll see in base flow conditions and then also in storm events. So this is the same picture just from the opposite bank. That's me standing there next to the sensor station. And then during a storm event, I would be completely underwater. Um, so looking at that online, it may seem like the sensor is damaged because the depth data spikes up. Um, but if you're used to your site, you'll know that it's actually a real life thing that you're looking at. So there are two different ways or a few different ways to view your data. Um, one is these sparkline plots that show you just, I think the last 72 hours of data, but then there is the time series analyst that really lets you dig in and see all of your data at once. And I like to use a time series analyst because it gives you a little bit more manipulation. Um, so I wanna, just like we um, just went over the sensor fouling and why it's so important to clean it, this is what it will look like most likely in most cases online um, is if it's a biofouling on the turbidity sensor, you'll see this gradual increase over time, just kind of slowly climbing up. And then right here, you can see someone went and cleaned the sensor and it dropped back down to almost zero. So again, it's really important to know what the normal ranges of your sensor station read so you can tell when something's off. Um, this is a little bit closer up picture of what it looks like when the sensors get cleaned. So you can see the data gradually starts climbing and then it becomes more and more fouled here until someone cleans it. Um, I did want to point out there's one other pattern that you may see in turbidity fouling, which is actually no response. So the orange line here is the turbidity values and the green line is the depth data. And you can see that even though the depth is going up, the turbidity isn't changing at all. So that kind of shows you that there's a problem going on, right? Because usually when depth data goes up, um, the turbidity values go up, they're positively correlated. So um, Carol actually noticed that something was going on here and she reached out to Shannon. And you can tell right here is where we went out and cleaned the sensor from this black fouling that was covering it. So even though Carol had been going out and cleaning the sensors, there was this black biofouling that was almost cemented on there. Even with cleaning, it wouldn't, um, the values wouldn't change. So we, Shannon had, actually, had to actually go out and clean it with a special type of acid to get that fouling off of it. And you can see here, you can't see the turbidity eyeball as we like to call it. And then here is the clean sensor. And that is where um, the values started reading accurately again. So these are some normal patterns that you'll see with the conductivity data. Normally, it's a dilution 
because rainwater, the conductivity of rainwater is close to zero. So when the blue line here is depth, the orange line is conductivity. When depth goes up, you normally see the conductivity drop. However, um, if you remember back to those pictures that Carol was showing us of the massive salt piles that tend to lie around, um, in the winter you can get salt runoff, which will actually cause your conductivity to spike. So these are pretty typical patterns for conductivity. It's a little more tricky noticing when the conductivity fouls because sometimes it just looks like this. In the beginning half, um, it looks like everything is fine, right? There's no major spikes, nothing really is changing. However, when we went out and cleaned the sensor, we saw this dramatic increase in conductivity. So sometimes even though the online data seems fine, it's actually fouled. So we went out and cleaned it and then you see the conductivity readings um, go back to what they should have been. And the only way we were able to tell this was by going into the field, taking a handheld measurement and seeing that it was off. And then once we cleaned the sensor, then they matched up. Um, so I know that was a lot of information and there's a lot more um, subtlety to all of this. So feel free to stick around and ask questions, especially about this section here. But I will pass it back to Dave now. Okay, and I will share my screen. Get to the right spot here. Okay, back to me again. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick uh, segment here on just reporting issues and emergencies and just getting help. So um, what we're considering urgent issues or anything that's causing bad data or no data. Um, we definitely, the goal here across the board is to just have continuous data. So first and foremost, um, you know, Stroud does not own these stations. They're owned by the different um, individuals associated with different watershed groups and schools across the basin. So definitely want to keep the station owner in the loop on everything that's happening with the station. Um, as needed, certainly keep us Stroud folks in the loop, me, Shannon, and Rachel, and George and Carol. Okay. Um, all these different types of issues is what we're talking about. You know, a vandalized station, cut wires, natural uh, influences, floods coming through, harming the stations, the black uh, uh, fouling that Rachel identified, as well as uh, data issues. Uh, Non-urgent issues, um, keep the kind of dialogue going with the, with your team and with the station owner is really, I think, important just to, to continue the dialogue, ongoing dialogue about what's happening with the station. Certainly we have this Delaware Basin Sensor Stations online group where you can pose questions to the, to the um, community of users. Um, and then also you can consult with mentors. Carol Armstrong and George Seeds are the Master Watershed Steward mentors right now. Rachel is also serving as a mentor as well. Um, so that's certainly available um, and we try to provide one-on-one -on -one support when, when, um, when it's needed. Um, monitor my watershed issues. Uh, as I mentioned, there, are, there can be kind of glitches with monitor. Um, Limnotech is the um, group that is kind of maintaining the infrastructure of Monitor My Watershed and they are responsive to when issues come up. Every now and again, there can be server issues, other types of connectivity issues. And um, you can certainly feel free to keep all of the group that I just mentioned in the loop with, if you see something like that, but you can also report via GitHub, okay? Um, highlighted in yellow here, you can access GitHub and you can actually report issues in there, okay? Um, excuse me, mentioning this link at the bottom here. This is the direct link that is from this section here, and that will take you to the exact section that addresses monitor my watershed issues within GitHub, okay? 
Uh, so we're moving on to the next section. And um, this is, I'm just going to be kind of giving a bit of an overview of data in general with regard to DRWI and these stations, and then turn it over to Mark and Diana um, to talk about uh, their efforts. So Enviro DIY and the DRWI. Stroud's um, intentions uh, with these stations in, in the Delaware River Watershed Initiative, as I mentioned previously, the primary goal with this was to support station owners um, in using the data, using the stations for their own purposes. Carol gave a couple of really nice case studies on this. Um, I've kind of already gone through these points, but the point there being just like, um, you master watershed stewards, you have a good um, kind of foundational knowledge now after having gone through the program of watershed ecology. Um, and you are spending the time on these stations um, to the point where you can start really, I think, giving good feedback and developing a good um, dialogue, good lines of communication with station owners to um, give feedback on how the stations are functioning and give feedback on how the data are actually being applied in that watershed. Um, so just keep that in mind with regard to your work. We're certainly like all for supporting people, uh, station managers, those who are maintaining stations, doing quality control. We're certainly all for um, folks building their knowledge and becoming the authorities on these watersheds and really being empowered and proactive to move forward um, with, uh, you know, actually applying the data, understanding the data, and giving feedback on what the data are suggesting about watershed conditions. Um, so that's the primary goal. Now, the secondary goal is a really interesting one too, though. Um, it's this idea of analyzing the data across the basin. This is secondary, um, but we are moving on it now. Um, Mark and Diana have spent some time over the last half year or so looking at the data, doing some analyses. As you know, we've collected, uh, we've, we've requested SD card data files from folks and we've received those and put them into our database. And uh, they have uh, been working on those data. Just to point out, it's a process that's in development and we're not really sure exactly where that's going to go because it's sort of a secondary goal. It's only been more recently that it's become a focus. And this DRWI, DRWI effort is certainly going on for um, the next several years at least. So um, we're not quite sure exactly where we're going to go with this broad analysis, but it certainly already seems to be um, producing some good results. So um, just a little bit more on this primary purpose um, idea. The, each of the stations um, have a project plan that was developed in the initial phases of deploying the station. So certainly I, uh, we encourage uh, you folks who are managing the stations to um, work with the station owners to review the project plans and build those project plans out, potentially refine them and develop them. Um, and then, as I mentioned, just working with a station owner to just build expertise and um, follow through with goals and defining roles and being organized about what is happening with the stations, the maintenance and quality control, the, um, the understanding of the data, the application of the data. Okay, um, so just in summary, you know, primary goal just moving forward with understanding the individual watershed and doing that in association with the um, station owner, building that out and just developing an ongoing kind of storyline of what is happening in the watershed with these stations as kind of your starting point. And then moving out from that with delineating watersheds and, and model my watershed, possibly doing ground scouting, whatever is applicable situationally. So, Secondary goal is what we're going to talk about now. I'm going to pass it off to um, Diana, who is uh, going to talk about conductivity. This is one of the plots that she developed uh, in later in 2019. She's going to build on that, I believe. And I think they're both going to talk individually about some of the um, 
different watersheds too. Um, so, bum, 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 bum. there's Diana and Mark, and I will pass it off to Diana now, and I will stop my, actually I'm going to go back, I will stop my screen share, Diana, and allow you to take over. Thanks, Dave. All right, so I'm going to start sharing my screen here. All right. Can you see my screen now? Yes, perfect. Awesome. All right, thanks. Um, like Dave said, uh, my name is Diana Oviedo. I am um, a research scientist at the Stroud Center. I'm the lead um, scientist in the Biogeo Watershed Biogeochemistry Group. And um, we have been um, doing a little bit of data analysis uh, on the data set that you guys have been collecting. <clears throat> uh, I'll say though that this is, well, Dave was mentioned is very preliminary. There will, there is so much more that we can do with this. Um, and hopefully it will, you know, it will be even more, uh, the more data you collect. Um, so it's also a lot of data and it's also sometimes a bit challenging uh, to manage, but we're doing, we're doing a lot of interesting things and I um, hope this is going to be, to show you at least, um, the beginning of, of the ideas that we have. Um, oops, I guess you're, which screen can you, can you see my PowerPoint? Yes, we see your PowerPoint, but nothing has advanced from your main slide. Hmm. Sometimes it seems the slide advance, the space bar slide advance on Zoom, you kind of have to click off of, click into your, onto your screen to make it work again. <clears throat> I was trying it. to have it, yeah, uh, in, in presentation mode, but then when I do that, I lose, I cannot see my, I cannot see the slide I'm on. Um, hmm. Hmm. How do I do this? Looks good here. Uh, I see your, uh, your presentation. All right, I think there. Now, now you can see my my slide. As long as you can you can still see it, then yeah, we see your main your your main introduction okay. slide. Okay. Hmm. All right, there. there Is it on the second slide now? Yep, it's on the second slide. It can be troublesome in Zoom sometimes advancing slides for some reason. Okay. Well, um, I'll tell you a little bit about the electric conductivity data um, that, that you guys and other stations have been collecting. Um, just a little bit of background, the electric conductivity, or sometimes also called conductance, is a measurement of the capacity of the water to conduct an electric current um, as a result of the movement of ions throughout a solution. Uh, and that, uh, the measurement will depend on uh, two things mainly, temperature and the amount of dissolved ions that you have in the water. Uh, what your sensor measures is specific conductivity, which has already been corrected for that dependency on temperature. So it really tells you, um, what, what the, your sensor tells you is a specific conductivity at 25 Celsius or conductivity at 20, 25 Celsius, which we call specific conductivity. Uh, it's measured in units of uh, micro or Siemens per centimeter or sometimes micro Siemens, milli Siemens or Siemens depending on, on whatever scale you want to use. Um, if you want a little bit more uh, detailed information on, on the concept of conductivity and other information, um, the USGS has a nice summary that I put here. Hopefully, uh, I guess you guys are not going to get the slide, maybe we'll share the no, slides we, later. We will be posting the slides to that Wiki Watershed DRWI page, Diana. Okay, so I can access those links there. <clears throat> um, we measure conductivity um, <clears throat> pretty much in, 
same kind of field or laboratory experiments that, that aquatic science scientists do, it's very common to measure conductivity because it's a very rapid indicator of water chemistry and water quality. And by just sticking a sensor in the water, it can tell you a lot about your stream or uh, your water body. And in fact, um, the USGS, the US Geologic Service um, survey measures um, specific conductivity in thousands of locations around uh, the, the United States. And I don't know how familiar you are with this, but um, this is a, an also a very interesting uh, kind of data set. You can go into the USGS uh, website and <clears throat> see a specific conductivity data from, again, thousands of sites in the continental, continental US. So, um, but, so it's, what specific conductivity is, um, this dependence in the concentration of the dissolved ice in the water is really what we're measuring. And um, just, just so we're all on the same page, when we're talking about concentration, that means the mass of solute uh, per unit of volume. And concentration only applies for something that's dissolved in the water. So anything that's in the water that's in particulate will not affect specific conductivity or will not contribute to conductivity. It has to be materials that are dissolved. And we're talking about atoms or molecules that um, have a charge, either positive or negative, uh, which are going to contribute or cause uh, or allow for the electric electricity to move through the water. So sodium chloride or salt, which is what we put in our food, is the most, um, the easiest example to think of. And the little diagram here shows the sodium, um, the salt structure when the salt is a solid. And then, <clears throat> I don't know if you can see my pointer. Can you see my pointer moving? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. we can see your pointer. Um, in solution, the um, uh, cations and anions, the negative and positive parts of the salt diss um, <clears throat> dissolve and become saturated where, um, by water in, um, that's what we call a solution. So, but salt or sodium chloride is not the only um, molecule that we find in the, in the natural waters. There's thousands of them. Um, here's just a list of the most common ones, but like, again, this is not exhaustive. There is so many more, uh, mostly in organic compounds, but organic compounds can also contribute to um, specific conductivity. So, <clears throat> if you have water that is pure, completely pure water, there will not be any conductivity in it. And the electricity cannot move through it because it's pure, there's nothing in it. But we know that natural waters are going to have um, ions, anions and cations in it as a, because just naturally they exist because they are in the environment. So what this um, graph has, uh, map shows you here is mean specific conductivity microsiemens per centimeter across the United States. This is a model that came up um, at the end of last year uh, produced by Oslo, Olson and, and Cormier in um, environmental science and technology. It's a, an interesting um, article too, if anybody wants the, the whole PDF, I can facilitate that. But what you can see is um, that across the United States, specific conductivity ranges from 10 to, or should range, I would say, from you know 10 to 2,000 microsiemens per centimeter. And the higher, higher specific conductivity you find mostly in the West um, part of the US. If we look at our um, watershed, which is somewhere around here, um, <clears throat> you see that really conductivity Mm, natural specific conductivity should only uh, range from, you know, 10 to maybe 300. So now looking at some of the data, just keep in mind that 300, 300 number. Um, just to give you an idea, we um, started working with, I think there is over 80 stations, but we've looked at a couple of years of in 50 stations. Um, and we did that through an initial sort of data um, quality control or quality, data quality analysis and um, 
uh, I'm not saying we're not going, we're going to discard all these other 30 stations. It's just that without going through too much trouble to clean up stuff, we um, settled on 50 stations that we have been working on uh, to look at some of the patterns. And so these uh, bars here show you the um, land use across those uh, 50 stations uh, or the land use in the watershed across those 50 stations so you um, can have an idea. We have a really nice variation um, in between in between forested agriculture developed uh, watersheds. And um, so now some data here, this, this is specific conductivity for those 50 stations. This is in micro Siemens per centimeter. Um, the graph on the top, all these little black things that you see here are <clears throat> box plots. And the, the bottom figure is basically an expansion of the top figure. This just because of the scale. So we're looking at a scale here from zero to 50,000. Uh, the box plots basically represent the distribution of your data. So every single little dot here is a data point, And then the box is the 25th and uh, 75th uh, centile of your data. And this little um, bar here is the, uh, the average. So this just gives you an idea of the distribution of the data. This uh, um, teal arrows are the sites that um, are for people who are present at the workshop today, I believe. And, uh, and so two things here, basically <laughs> we have sites in which specific conductivity goes through the roof basically um, every once in a while and sometimes most of the year, uh, specific conductivity is very high. For example, this site, Hurricane Run, um, or the or Rocky Run, for example, where specific conductivity is up to the 50,000. So zooming in, then you can see on a, on a smaller scale or um, on a zoom scale, a little bit better what the variation is. And, like, and this is a, that 300 um, line, which would be what the natural specific conductivity or the background specific conductivity should be in this, in our area or in the Delaware River Basin. Um, now these are you guys' sites. Uh, only, so you can see um, for the people that are present at the workshop, these are their sites. I'm sorry that these are so small. Hopefully you can identify uh, yourself here. The, the, the names are so small. But um, so they're not, the, most of the sites in, in average are pretty close to, you know, maybe that 300, but still we have some cases in which the conductivity goes up to 2,000 and some, um, a few cases of conductivity up to the 4,000 micro Siemens per centimeter. I'm gonna skip this because I'm um, running late here. So the um, graph on, the, on your left shows um, the, the distribution of specific, mean specific conductivity of each of those 50 sites as a function of percent developed land. So this is urbanization. And uh, what we're looking at is basically um, it, what, you know, it's very intuitive. It looks like um, human activities, uh, urbanized land is, is a, a big factor in increasing specific conductivity in our study sites. And uh, the graph on the, on the right is just a selection of um, those sites where there is highly um, developed, what's considered highly developed land, um, and these are just the sites that have shown so far the highest specific conductivity. Uh, and that's just a very nice regression between um, mean specific conductivity and percent developed land. Um, am I on time, Dave? Uh, we're running a little bit behind Diana, um, but I, I think we're in a reasonable range. I would just continue and just kind of keep up your, your pace. Okay. So um, there's a couple of things that Rachel mentioned here uh, is what I, I was hoping to refer to is um, for sites where we know that there is very little human influence. Uh, for example, um, Aquashicola Creek, which is a forested stream for the most part, it's about 80% forested. Tempore and when we look at the temporal trends, we see that um, Specific conductivity is highest in the summer uh, when we have the least 
amount of or the highest amount of groundwater influence and so always your groundwater is going to be well not always but in a in a natural system or system that is little influenced by human activities your groundwater will have um, higher conductivity than rainwater and so rainwater will dilute that signal um, and so in the summer you see higher specific conductivity but then during the winter time in the springtime where you have rain that um, groundwater signal is basically diluted uh, but then we will look at a site like Naylor's Run, which is mostly urban. Uh, we see that that's not really the case anymore. And we start seeing those patterns of really high, um, episodes of very high uh, specific conductivity, especially during the winter time. But then they carry into the fall and to the spring as well. Um, so this is what Rachel was describing, I'm not gonna to spend too much time on it, but it's the idea that uh, rain events, uh, this is again a forested site. We have depth of the water here. So in um, teal and that variation you see is due to rain events or sto um, snow storm events. And as um, water depth increases, the conductivity decreases um, is that the dilution effect that even though we see in parts of the year in Naylor's Run, which is the urban site, we do see uh, basically the opposite pattern happens, happening mostly in the winter where we have those spikes that are in this case, most likely related to salt application. So um, salt applications um, it are, in the road salt applications is one of the cases uh, for sanitization of fresh water, but there's other reasons. Um, fertilizers, uh, demineralization of concrete and um, sewage and industrial waste discharge and also contribute to, well, mining as well, um, contribute to um, the salinization of fresh waters. Um, so just to give you an idea here of the potential effects of desalinization on stream health, this is um, using a very simple, just back of the end of calculation and a model that was published by um, Cormier and others uh, last year, two years ago. This model, what they did is they used macrovertebrate data and figured out a relationship between um, extirpation of uh, benthic invertebrates and specific conductivity. And uh, this model, what allows you to do is calculate based on background specific conductivity, what would be the conductivity necessary to extirpate a fraction of your um, benthic invertebrate taxa? And so for our area where we know that 300 microsiemens per centimeter is like the natural numbers, uh, based on that model, 500 microsiemens per centimeter would be enough to kill 50% or 5% of the um, microinvertebrate or benthic macroinvertebrate taxa in your in your stream. Um, so you know that gives you an idea if you if if, uh, if 500 is is enough to kill or extirpate five percent, then when we have a site that goes up to fifty thousand, what is that doing to biota? So in summary, um, we see that some tributaries of the Delaware River Basin are experiencing uh, increased salinity, which is likely affecting um, stream uh, microorganisms in general, uh, and that that's likely related to um, land use, especially urbanization. We see uh, winter streams that are likely related extremes that are likely related to road salt application. Um, however. Um, the uh, increased specific conductivities is sometimes present year round, um, particularly in agricultural or especially or um, exclusively in agricultural and urban streams. Um, so with that, I <clears throat> guess we'll take questions at the end. Or yes, we will. Like we will take questions at the end. Um, so I would suggest, Diana, if you can. Thank you for that, that was great. Um, you can stop screen share, and then Mark, if you just wanna share your screen and proceed with your talk on temperature. Okie doke. All good? 
Excellent. Yep. All right, so I'll pretty much be presenting something very similar to what Diana was talking. And, uh, but instead of the connectivity, we'll talk about temperature. Um, my name is Mark Papak. I'm an assistant research scientist and uh, an ecosystem ecologist at the, at the Straw Center. Um, and I guess I wanted to, to start, see if I have the same problem or not. Okay, it takes a little while to advance. Oh, there you go. So there's a million things that you can measure once you set a station, right? And, and um, one question that why temperature has a very, a very similar answer, actually. There's, it's hard to think of a better, uh, more cohesive indicator of what's going on in the stream than temperature, because temperature kind of pretty much affects everything as, as for instance, Diana was uh, referring to the effects on, on how we measure conductivity, for instance, that so we have to account for temperature too. This is probably the most common plot in biology, at least, or one of the oldest, a relationship between temperature and growth rate of any organism. Uh, we all have a minimum temperature that we can operate and survive, a maximum one before the proteins start to, um, to degrade, and an optimum. That's our ideal uh, temperature, which is typically warmer than colder. And that has tremendous effects. For instance, these days, one that it's hitting us really hard is this increased frequency of algal blooms in lakes, but also in rivers, that it's pretty much driven by temperature because those streams have been polluted for a while, but now they get warmer and they hit this optimum growth that really allows this algae to spike and starts growing um, in, to nuisance levels, in fact. Temperature also dictates uh, what fish community, but also what other you know, insects or types of algae, any organism has a specific temperature range that can tolerate or prefers, and that uh, affects how they are uh, distributed across, across the, the landscape. And probably the most common ones that we think of are trout and the need for trout to relatively colder water versus other um, fishes that are actually quite happy with how things are changing like carp, but every species will have a temperature range and therefore we know the temperature and the variation in temperature, we can simply learn a lot about the possibility of what fish can we and we cannot find in that stream without the need to, to do any electrofishing, for instance. And another issue that, that it's why temperature is so, so critical and so uh, inherently fundamental for the ecology of streams is that it affects also the toxicity of any toxic. And at Stroud, uh, John Jackson and Dave Funk <coughs> have been working their entire lives and recently published this paper that shows in this plot uh, the relationship between temperature and survival with a third variable, which is salinity here. So these two lines are reflecting a decrease in the, in the amount of survival uh, mayflies once they are exposed to a given concentration of chloride and a higher concentration. Now, obviously, if they have a higher uh, salinity, less of the mayflies actually survive. That's why this line is lower than the other one. But it's also relevant to notice this difference, how it gets bigger and bigger. When it gets warmer, those mayflies are breathing much more often and harder. They're pumping uh, water and air through their system, and therefore the toxics are also getting into it. Uh, faster, quicker, and, and therefore creating more mortality. So warmer temperature, I don't want to say it's bad for pretty much everything, but in a kind of way, it's hard to, once we start getting things really warm up about 25 C or over 75 Fahrenheit, uh, there's a whole lot of problems that come in. And that's actually what's happening, right, with climate change. And this is a nice, nice plot that sends actually two messages. And why I think it's so important that you guys are, are doing the work you do out there, uh, keeping an eye on warming temperatures. One is that of the streams and rivers in the US that we actually look at it, about 65% are showing this these increase. And if, if the predictions about climate change uh, turn out to be absolutely correct, they're quite uh, devastating. But it's also interesting to notice that you know, 35% of it are not. So it's not that simple. There are many streams uh, for a variety of reasons that are actually cooling off. And 
it, this variation at, at the continent at the continent scale it also shows up in the data that, that we are presenting that you guys are collecting that there's a lot of variation and things aren't always easy so keeping an eye on almost on a case-by-case -case basis is just the only way to go um, what I'll be talking today is temperature of course and among the others um, uh, parameters that you guys are measuring and you know they've emphasized that and Deanna too and again we've just we've just begun to scrape the surface this is the tip of the iceberg um, I'm only going to be talking about summer data and 2017 and 2018 and we are close to have you're close to have double that and we haven't done it yet because probably as you our major limiting factor is time but the the possibilities are endless and I do believe that that's that's what seed science will will change. That the amount of, of uh, data that are, are generated is just um, um, breathtaking. So to start somewhere, this is a plot for um, average daily temperature, and those those are all the same 50 sites Diana introduced. So the average falls somewhere around 20 C, which is pretty good actually. And there are multiple sites below their average and uh, multiple above, but not surprisingly, since this is showing the average and this is pretty much um, a way to show you what, what Diana kind of showed you too that we don't among the participants whoop, we don't really have bad size so sites so to speak like perhaps the warmest one was Marsh Creek and uh, not even one of this uh, so many of the sites that are, are being uh, monitored by some of the participants are kind of in terms of temperature, uh, one of the, the cooler and probably related, in fact, totally related to the land use, the predominant land use in, in their watersheds. But uh, as you can see, there's a great, a great gradient, great range of changing conditions in temperature, which going from a 15 average temperature to something like a 23, 23 that's, a, that's a lot because you know, to, to make the average to go down to 14 or 15 or or even these ones in here, it really means not only that you just got the right day, I mean, all that data summarized in this average is really representing um, a healthy system, at least from a temperature perspective. Um, there's some very, you know, I was a little surprised about some very evident perhaps, but, but clear and neat patterns that typically forested uh, watersheds versus agricultural mix ag and urban and forest and urban or develop there's this nice increase in average temperature i think that if at this point you start seeing these patterns will probably uh, still be there once we incorporate more more data but we'll see this is what we expected but at least it's it's kind of nice to see that um the the what we know and what we the new data uh, coming in are actually in agreement and in some of the the plots that we are generating and again um, they're just simple correlations but are kind of encouraging because you know with the correlation you always have to be a little bit cautious about what's causing it but in this case we kind of feel that we, we do have an idea why this is happening why when we increase the amount of forested land in a watershed the mainstream temperature decreases and if you look at the slope, the idea is uh, by foresting, you know, what a 10% forested area in the watershed could be translated in a, in a decrease on average stream temperature of about half a degree. And probably many of you know, but Stroud uh, has also a large team of uh, restoration ecology, planting trees and trying to you know, make those, um, to provide that, that shade to the stream, that cool temperatures. And here is, here is a little bit of a, proof or piece of that puzzle that shows that you can actually do um, decrease temperatures by simply planting trees. I was, for instance, expecting to see a much better correlation between urban development and temperature, basically because once we have streams on concrete and no trees, they're simply going to get hot. And it wasn't really there. Um, perhaps we don't really have um, truly intense urban streams in the in the in the basin but something that it was interesting is that when we look at the open space development so you know, golf parks and or simply parks three less environments we see the opposite pattern we see an increase in in summer temperature uh, we call that development but it would be interesting to see uh, 
if in the future there are more sites coming in uh, right in the middle of cities or, or um, high intense development, if we can actually provide some data points on this part of the plot and see how that goes. Again, those are not very surprising, but at least are encouraging to, to see that, um, that we, we, can, we can see the, the effects of temperature um, by the land use uh, that, we, that we anticipated. Uh, something else that I think those data from the whole um, the whole basin and the whole um, citizen science uh, project going on that is very valuable is that you can really be sentinels of the thermal stress for some of these streams that may still have some trout and we know pretty well the range of cold water fisheries that range is actually what the state of Pennsylvania uh, dictates that should be in streams that have or should have uh, any of the salmonids. And another thing is that you, we can also, you can, the data you're collecting can also provide guidance for what streams are actually, from a temperature perspective, ready to be stuck and therefore bring back recreation and a whole lot of other benefits that might come with stocking. Although, you know, this is, this is its own topic and it's in its zone, but there's also a range that a stream must be in compliance and that changes from June to August, every two other weeks, you gotta, you gotta be at a different temperature. But the data you are collecting have enough resolution to show that. And one way to do it is to generate this sort of like barcodes. This is, this is summer 2018 from June to September. And here are all the sites that should be here today. Uh, you know, we have all the 50 sites and more years, but just to make it um, simple, I, I kind of brought it down to only 2018 and, and the, the sites of the participants. And what this plot does is to show or ask the question, how many hours a day are we exceeding or violating the cold water criteria? Of course, some of these streams are very much far from being cold, water, cold waters and are not, may have not even any intention to be, but some others, uh, punches for instance, clearly have enough um, cool temperatures to provide good habitat for trout. And some others are very far away and some others, uh, if you look at these purple colors, might be actually about 10 or 15 hours a day exceeding these uh, cold uh, the cold water criteria for set by the state of Pennsylvania. And therefore, I'm just still a long way to go if the target of restoration is to bring them back to the temperatures that they might have had before um, widespread reforestation. This is just a visual, visual way to represent this, but the importance of the matter is that the data you are collecting is there to tell whether or not on a daily basis, how many hours a day, not just if we actually recorded one temperature that exceeded, uh, which doesn't really tell you the story, but there's enough resolution to generate all these, is, each, one, each bar is a day, and right now, as I said, you'll have more of that. And in some cases where, you know, or punches or some others pickering that they're the good or the bad, but some cases where you are right on that, on that verge, on that um, threshold of whether or not potential uh, reintroduction of trial would be a possibility, it is really great to have those, those data. Um, for instance, for the stocking temperature criteria, well, now, Many of the streams are in compliance with that because the range is much warmer, but in some cases you would still, you know, uh, be able to use, look at those data and realize that if we stock fish here, we're basically going to bring them to the slaughterhouse because they're not going to make it. So all this um, very informative, very helpful to have. And there are other agencies that do this work and don't do it that well, frankly. So. This is a fantastic piece of um, information. And, and the last thing that I want to present is, is what uh, Rachel and Diana talk a little bit too, of these temperature uh, surges or what happens when we have storm events and a lot of water comes into the stream. Thus, you, you've, been, you've been shown that conductivity goes, typically goes down, but can also go up if there's, a, if there's a, an effect of road salt around the area. And with temperature, you know, typically we think of sharp changes in temperature associated with storm events that are over a 1.3 degree over 15 minutes. So that's basically saying every 15 minutes, we, we either increase or decrease temperature by one degree. So rapid, very fast changes 
associated with storm events. And again, you can also we can also calculate with with um, with data you're collecting all that, and we've done part of it. But uh, as Diana said, there there were not really you know highly polluted sites at least today in the list that they um, gave us. And and the example I have here is for Chestnut Run, which is a highly agricultural stream. And what we saw here is that you know assuming this threshold of 1.3 change per per 15 minutes. There's technically not temperature surges or, or not at least they, they, not if we set the, the minimum at that. But what is interesting to me is that water depth, which is representing when the storm happened, all these spikes and temperature, if you notice, it typically goes much like conductivity when you have um, uh, a lot of runoff from the storm gets into the water. Not only that conductivity is low, but typically it's actually, actually cooler water. So it decreases uh, the temperature of the stream, not fast enough to be called a surge and therefore perhaps a problem for just a big shock in temperature for some of the organisms that live there. But the important thing is that it goes down. It decreases with storm flows. And when we look at urban watersheds like Cobbs Creek, which is the most urban watershed I could find in this list, it is the other way around. We see these spikes in temperature. and uh, there's some work done on how the storm ponds that we have right now, storm pond ret retention, that try to minimize all the water getting into the stream at the same uh, time. They do a good job at doing that, but at the same time, when they do this, they then store water there for a while that can get actually pretty hot during the summertime. And over the next storm, all that hot water gets to the river and makes this change, positive change in temperature which is contrary to what we see, or the opposite of what we see in, in forested or ag, which there, there's not, um, not such thing as storm pond events, uh, storm ponds in, in, the, in the urban development. So um, summary, some of the things that we can start seeing, but again, this is just, we're just beginning, some cooling effects of forested watersheds, not surprising, but, you know, reassuring to see that uh, forested watersheds actually maintain um, colder waters. There's the possibility to use this um, data you guys are collecting to check uh, whether or not there's compliance of cold water designations, which streams could be stocked, and just simply to keep an eye on whether or not it's in regulation that's good enough. But I think, I think there's also even more to, to, to explore uh, because it's, it's a very it's beautiful high resolution temperature data set. And finally, these contrasting patterns of uh, storm flow on depending on the land uses, I think it's, it's, it's something that could even drive some of the research that some, some has been done, but probably not, not enough. And, and it happens many times that when we design infrastructure for um, tackle one problem <laughs> and other, other problems show uh, associated with that, and we, we gotta keep going and, and improving. And that's all I had, just to acknowledge and, and I'll try to be around for questions. Excellent, thank you, Mark. Um, I'm, let me stop sharing. I'm going, yeah, if you can, let me see, I'm gonna share yep. my screen. Bum, 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 bum. Okay, okay, and we will move on quickly, we're starting to run out of time here. We're a little behind schedule. So um, we'll move on to George and Carol with final thoughts and I will pass it off to George. You Are you muted, George? You might need to take off your mute. Thank you, there we go. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, one of the things that we've observed is that sometimes master watershed stewards um, and owners, you know, get enthusiastically involved in, as volunteers in stream monitoring, but the roles and the responsibilities of the master watershed stewards uh, and the station owner are not always clear. Um, now, most everybody on the call is already involved and to some degree may have you know, uh, may not be having any issues with that, but um, even if you have been involved for a while, there may be some things on these on this list uh, that 
might be helpful for you to go back and revisit. Um, but we've, I've outlined some guidelines to help establish structure and clarity around the roles and responsibilities of the master watershed stewards and the station owner. Um, these obviously can vary from organization to organization, uh, which is why communication between the master watershed steward and the station owner are very important. I'll just quickly go through them. Um, uh, master watershed steward and station owner um, ideally should meet in person when the master watershed steward gets involved. And, uh, and if you're already involved, uh, to you know, do that on an ongoing basis occasionally. We want to understand um, the owner organization's purpose and goals for stream monitoring and data collection. Um, Master Watershed Steward should obtain a copy of the Sensor Station project plan if possible. Uh, the owner of the station should have this available and could be very helpful for the Master Watershed Steward to understand what the, what the goals and objectives are for that particular station. Um, understand the owner and manager's need and what specific tasks they need support with. Um, be clear about Master Watershed Steward's interest and skill set and availability to ensure there is good fit between the owner's needs and expectations. Um, and then to establish any additional training or the support of a, if the support of a mentor is needed. Um, and then to agree on the Master Watershed Steward specific tasks and schedule. And then, and then to discuss and agree on the best way to communicate for questions, shovel troubleshooting, and routine updates. And then also to determine if other volunteers are involved, clarify responsibilities and how communication and activities will be coordinated. You know, one of the things that I've seen where there's um, a number of volunteers involved in, in maintaining one site, sometimes it's difficult to coordinate uh, the activities among the multiple master watershed stewards. Um, so it would be ideal if right up front all that protocol and methodology can be established. And then to have monthly online meetings for master watershed stewards and other volunteers and station owners um, in Stroud Water Research to, on an ongoing basis, um, identify and solve problems. And the, the, the monthly meetings is one thing that um, uh, we've talked about initiating, and I think after this meeting, I think going forward on a monthly basis, uh, we'll be planning similar sort of user group meetings um, to take place for Mr. Watershed stewards and owners. Um, and then next slide, Dave. Then as, as kind of a guide in order to facilitate the Master Watershed Steward and Sensor Station owner to establish the structure and guidelines to sort of walk you through that list that I just went over. Um, I developed this sort of draft questionnaire, which we'll put into um, an actual form that we can post um, as, a, as a resource for folks to use. Um, whether you're just getting involved as a new master watershed steward or whether you've already been involved, it could serve to help clarify roles and responsibilities. I won't go over each, each item specifically, but you can see that it covers the key items that I just uh, went over. So I'll step up here. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit more about the responsibilities of the, of the mentee, the person being uh, mentored. But first, I want to lay out some other basics about mentoring. Mentoring isn't just about talking to uh, Shan, uh, Rachel or George or I or Krista in some cases. Mentoring is an essential part of success of working relationships within the context of stream ecology work. It involves individual pursuits, collaborative efforts, the watershed association, conservancies or educational institutions efforts, as as well as national objectives for clean water and resilience to climate change. So no matter how much experience someone has, mentorship needs attention from everyone. The mentor is a prudent advisor and teacher or coach. And the relationship of mentor and mentee, you might perceive it as vertical within the organization per, per your experience of the organization, but experience shows that a horizontal interaction is actually more effective. 
Good chemistry is helpful, such as feeling comfortable in discussing issues, both professional and personal, in a lighthearted, sensitive, and frank way. And it requires availability and interest on the part of both parties. So meeting all of the members of the watershed group might lead to identifying one of the persons with whom a volunteer has that chemistry and feels comfortable in communication. And mentoring relationships are challenged by increased institutional demands on the mentors. So here, some of the, uh, think about, I'm asking the, uh, the volunteers to think about this. So one, take personal responsibility for your own volunteerism and your own sense of effectiveness. We all can uh, you know, run dry on this at some point and it's good to, to realize that we're the only ones who can change it. Uh, the role of an individual development plan is something to think about. Um, it, to document pro or to work towards progress. So you have to be patient with the mentor's time by being prepared when having a discussion, but don't ever be reticent in approaching your mentor. And if needed, you can change mentors. Um, have, you know, there could be, as George said, communication of expectations and needs. What about uh, other, re other mentors and other resources? You can consider having more than one mentor from within the organization or from outside the organization, another source. So mentors can serve different purposes for you. Having multiple mentors can serve different purposes. And the last thing is we are trying to develop leadership skills in ourselves and in others. And remember that you might become a mentor yourself sometime. Thank you. And there are the mentors that Carol just mentioned. Um, we will be sharing this presentation um, afterwards and um, you can certainly all feel free to just be in touch with all of the presenters today. So moving on, um, I'm just gonna real quickly go through this because we, we'd like to still have some time for questions. We did have some um, thoughts from uh, attendees on just wanting some information about uh, how to build a station and what resource, resources were available for that. Um, you know, we're just encouraging folks, if you do wanna build a station, um, you need to really know like what that involves and, and really asking yourself like questions about why do you want it? What questions is it gonna help to answer? What are your intentions um, for the station and the data? And considering like, the resources that are needed, money to purchase equipment and replace equipment when it breaks. Personnel is a very, very important factor. Um, personnel that have time and capacity to um, not only build a station, but maintain the station and do quality control. Important steps, as Rachel pointed out. And then time to monitor the data and deal with issues as they happen, and they do happen. As many of you have seen, it's just kind of inherent to the process, okay? Um, so just a little more on this. We have information available that you can uh, look into to get an idea about what building a station consists of, consists of. We have a couple recent blogs, one by Jim Moore, one by Robert Sarnowski. Both, uh, are, both of those individuals are on the call today. They built uh, cheaper, um, simpler versions of the stations that we're talking about today. Jim did a low cost uh, conductivity sensor and Robert did a very low cost temperature sensor, both of which are um, uh, contributing data to monitor my watershed. There are videos, installation videos, and we just did a building workshop earlier this week. Um, and those videos will be available as well. The manual itself goes through the entire process of building a station, the types of stations we're talking about today. Um, and then the Enviro DIY website is also just filled with information for technolo technology and technical aspects of building stations. So this was the, the workshop that we just did this week, which is essentially um, assembling a kit, programming the data logger, assembling the kit this way, um, and then setting the station up to transfer data to monitor my watershed. All of those uh, materials that were included in that workshop will be available to people outside of that workshop at some point. Um, so as I mentioned, some recent blogs, this one that Robert did, very thorough. Uh, it a, uses very simple technology and he has a, re, did a really nice step-by-step -step guide. You can find that on Enviro DIY. 
Um, and as I mentioned, we did this workshop recently and those materials that uh, were associated with that workshop will be available on the Wiki Watershed DRWI site. Okay, so just some final points before we go to questions. Really take advantage of this website. Um, that's, you know, you should be going there anyways to enter field data sheet information. You can review past entries. You can filter the spreadsheet in order to find your particular site or other sites that you're interested in. And as, I've men as we've mentioned, there's manuals, guidance materials, videos, and actual workshop materials in that website. Keep, as Rachel mentioned, keep the quick guides handy and reference them as needed. Um, again, going to the point of interacting with and working with station owners, um, a lot of the station owners don't have a lot of time and they can really use support from folks to keep them updated on what's happening with the station and actually give them guidance at times on um, the data and what the issues are with the station and, and maybe even taking it um, and applying the data to local watershed issues. Carol is really experienced with that type of thing and she is continuing to move on those types of subjects. Um, using Monitor My Watershed definitely uh, everyone should get, be getting familiar with Monitor My Watershed to track station function and data. Tracking the actual function of the station as well as understanding the data in terms of the ecology within the watershed. And then just simply actually visiting the station, visiting Monitor My Watershed regularly. Know the site, know the watershed, know the data. Become the authority yourself. Clean the sensors and do the quality control. Get in there and just, you know, do it and that will that will really feed your understanding of the situation. And then, you know, just certainly complete a field data sheet. If we don't, if, if you don't have a visit on record, then you have no way to reference back um, in the future as to what happened at the site. Okay, so um, that concludes the presentation and we have 10 minutes uh, of our official time to answer questions. So uh, I will leave this up this screen up for a little bit and then I'll take it down and we can um, uh, start fielding questions at which point I think um, we have some questions in the chat box and um, Carol I don't know do you want to do you want to re review the questions in the chat box and just kind of bring them up um, and we can address them I'm going to stop share now so uh, these questions about the who to call list really have been pretty much answered in the chat box, answered already, but I'll just say that um, Megan Hopkins Doer is going to um, update me on some of the references for the who to call list because it uh, originated from a 